Well, we begin looking at how do I know whether something is right in a very concrete and practical way. We try to get to this because it's a valid point, it's a valid question. Uh, uh, not that our studies are not valid, but we want to be sure that we also can be very practical about what it is to serve God and how to do it. And sometimes, um, especially at first when we are new to being Christians or when we are young, we uh, need a little bit of help. So I'm hoping to give you more than a little bit of help. First of all, let me say that is a good question, and I'm glad that you have this question. And I will quote from the Bible at number 6, verses 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Because it is good that you want to know what is right. That you want to know what God wants you to do. This we rejoice in, I rejoice in, and uh, the children of God rejoice in this. We're glad that you're interested in that and want to know the answer to how to make God happy. That's excellent. And I'm uh, sincere in saying, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and show you grace. May he lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. I hope that everybody will obey the gospel, that everybody will please God, and that they will obtain that blessing. I will also quote Psalm 134, where it is written in its entirety. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. So if you're thinking about the Lord even in the nighttime, that's good. It's a good question, and it is a thing that is blessed, and we hope that you will continue in that trend, and God will bless you, the one who made heaven and earth. So first, we should say thank you for the encouragement, thank you for the good question, and yes, it's always good and right when we want to make God happy. Then may you succeed. I do think we should look at some guiding principles first, and I will lay down these guiding principles before we get into concrete things. But the first guiding principle is in Proverbs 1, and that is to let the Bible dictate what is right. The Bible will tell you what is the right thing to do. And this is where Proverbs 1, 7 comes in. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if you are not interested in the wisdom that's contained in the book, if you are not accepting instruction that comes from this book, you are among the fools. But if you fear the Lord, if you're concerned about what he thinks and what he wants, that is where knowledge starts. It starts with that fear, that respect. But fear, let God tell you what he wants. Another principle is this one. There's only three here. Test any answer you get. When, some, when you ask somebody what's right and wrong, they're going to tell you something. Test it. Don't just accept it. If it's your mother, if it's your father, if it's your spiritual leader, whatever it is, you put this to the test. It's a human being, and we're all fallible. And Jesus said in John 7, 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he'll know whether the teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own authority. It's when you want to do what God wants you to do that you can tell the difference between, you know, some somebody speaking on their own, making things up perhaps, and a teaching that really does come from God. When you want to do what God wants you to do, that's when you begin to Tell the difference. So put those answers to the test. See if that's in the Bible or not. And then, when in doubt, cut it out. That's one of the first very practical things. If 
If you're wondering whether something is right or not, then don't do it yet. Find out whether it's right before you do it. Romans 14, 14 says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus. Nothing is unclean in and of itself, but it's unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. And in this passage, we're talking about the things that they are doing under Jewish religion. Is it clean in and of itself to eat pork? Well, in and of itself, the pork is clean, and you can eat it. Is it clean uh, to do work on a Saturday even though that is the Sabbath day in the law of Moses. Well, it is still clean. You can do those things. They're not unclean. When it comes to food and drink and holidays and festivals, those things are just not, they're just not part of the gospel. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's righteousness and peace. But then the 22nd verse said, Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. The blessing comes when you approve of something that isn't causing you judgment. It's not causing you to be condemned. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. That's why we said let the Bible dictate because faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. But when in doubt, cut it out is the rule here. We're saying it may be clean to eat this, but if you think it's not clean, if you think that there's a religious implication, or there could be, and you just go ahead and do it anyway, well, that's not showing the fear of God. That's not showing the respect of God or the concern for what he thinks. You should go find out first. And then you can do it. All right, so when it down, cut it out. All right. Now, let's talk about do it yourself. <laughs> what can you do to find out what is right? All right. The first thing, perhaps obvious, although I don't believe there's any such thing as obvious in the world, is James, five, uh, James 1. I think I wrote 5 on that other slide, didn't I? Sorry. James chapter 1. First 5, though. The first thing you can do, do it yourself, is ask God. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. So the first thing is, you can pray to God to find out. Ask him to help you find this out. You know, let him know that you do not want to upset him. You don't want to cross him. You want to know what is right. And he will help you. Now we don't mean that it will suddenly appear in your brain like a miraculous answer. Or that he will say something to you or reveal a pattern in a tortilla that will tell you. No, 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 no. But we do mean that he answers prayer. You'll find out. And he won't let you fall into this problem before you're ready. Again, he gives generously and without reproach. If you know that you lack the knowledge or the wisdom, ask God. He will help you. Second thing under do it yourself is read every day. This is a little bit, you know, proactive, preemptive, but it's true. Read every day so that you know the Word of God and you know more of it every day. Joshua chapter 1, Chica of the Lord, sets Joshua up to lead the people into the promised land, and he tells him, Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And this is true. If you care enough 
about God and ask him what is right and how do I know whether this thing is okay? Is this thing okay or not? He will help you, yes, and he has given us the command and said, I will go with you. I will be with you. The Lord wants us to be delivered from temptations, from evil, from wrongdoing. He wants us to be with him in heaven. He didn't create us to destroy us. He didn't create the earth to be barren. He wants us to enjoy these good things and to have a life with him. So read every day, as it said to him earlier in Joshua 1 to 8, do not let this book depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Be careful to do everything written in it. Why do you got to know what it says to do that? You should read. Habitual reading. But now, we get to the tools section. Those are the principles. Those are the things that guide understanding and growth and, and stay with those things. Let's look at tools together. Here's a thing that you can do in Bible study. There are these things that they call concordances. And in a concordance, they have listings of words and where those words appear in the Bible. As in, it gives you the verses where that word shows up. Now, you can do this in English using Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, which if you've ever picked one up is also exhausting. It's a very large and heavy volume. And in it, there are these, you know, the English words, the King James Version, but the English words are there, so I guess if you don't have the King James, you're going to have to go to the verse that you're looking for. Find it in the King James Version, then you can look up that word in Strong's Concordance. Okay, you'll be able to find out all the places in the Bible where that English word was used by the translators of the King James Version. Very often, you can do good topical study this way, you'll find that. However, I will say, uh, there's a limitation to what you can do by searching in English, which is that it isn't always the case that you know, one original word is translated by one English word. And sometimes one English word actually translates more than one original word. So that can be difficult. Um, sometimes there are things in the original that are not obvious in the English, and you'll miss them if you're searching in English. Or sometimes there are things that in the original are not actually related, but the English looks like it is from just the word and concordance search. So that's a little bit of a temper, a little limitation on that method, not saying don't use it, just saying caveat. How we ought to emptor. You know, buyer beware. There are some limitations to that method. Now, to overcome the King James Version constraint and uh, you know, the weight of a heavy volume, you can go on the internet where they have Bible Gateway, I believe it's .com, and they have blueletterbible.org. Um, Bible Gateway is you know, a lot of people like that one. It's pretty good for English. You, there are multiple different versions you can use, and you can search in all of those versions for your English words quite easily. You can also have them side by side and parallel for your own personal study, enrichment, enjoyment, whatever you want. Um, but I want to focus on Blue Letter Bible because it is the sharpest tool. It is, in fact, the tool that I use almost the whole time, until something gets really bad. That's what I use. Very often, it's the only tool that I use in the preparation of a sermon. It's when some word, I need to know a lot more about this word. That's when I have to go with some other tool, and that's a different problem. But start here. I have on the screen a picture, a screenshot, a capture of my latest visit to blueletterbible.org in which I will show you that when you go to a passage, in this case I've chosen James 1, it's just an example. 
When you go to James 1, the verses are listed there, as you can see. There's that James, servant of God, blah, 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 blah. And verse 2 underneath, they count it all joy, brethren, as you might know. Right? Well, to the left of those verses, which I have zoomed in on in this screenshot, there is a little button called Tools. In that button, there are multiple tools, which are interlinear, Bibles, cross-references, commentaries, dictionaries, and scholinius. I consider all of those useless, except for interlinear. I don't trust the denominations to come up with Bible references. I certainly don't trust them to come up with commentaries. And their dictionaries are just not that helpful, frankly. If you really need a dictionary, you need to go to the original dictionaries that you know the people who discovered and cataloged these languages and put them into English wrote. Okay, if you're gonna use a Greek dictionary, you need to use Liddell and Scott. You gotta use a Hebrew dictionary. I'm not sure. You gotta try to find something. But you can get very far without getting to the point of needing a dictionary. And in the case of a Greek dictionary, you can come talk to me. I am not a dictionary, but I have one and know how to use it. However, you'll be surprised how far you can get without the dictionary. So if you click on this thing and you go to enter linear. This opens up, which is right under the verse in the page that you're on, opens up this, whatever this is, with interlinear, this tab that I'm on is the interlinear. And, you know, there's some up there. And then you can see on the left-hand side, in large writ, inflected, root, and transliterated. You can see in the second column, Strong's, we'll talk about that in a moment, and in the third column, English. This one is from the New American Standard on, which is fine. The rest of this, you don't care. You just don't care about the rest of it. That's all that matters. Because what we're looking for is the word that I want to know something about. It's on this list. There in the third column under English. That's the first thing. I want to find that word. I've chosen to find the word dispersed because it's an interesting one. So in this James chapter 1, when you hit tools and you go to interlinear, then all the words are listed, dispersed. That's the one that I've got a screenshot of up right now. You will notice that to the left, the thing called Strong's is actually a link, which you can peek. <laughs> what this is is actually a Strong's number because the crazy thing about Strong's, and like I say, it's exhaustive and exhausting. It's an excellent resource, don't get me wrong. It's just, you know, we've come a long way since the Edison wax cylinder, you know? <laughs> um, that's a number. He numbered every word in the original text. When a word got used in the New Testament text in Greek, he assigned a number to that word. Which is useful because now you can do a Greek concordance lookup by using the Strong's number. Because that will now show you every place where the Greek word that you're looking for is being used. If you look up dispersed, you may or may not find all the same things, and you may or may not find that all the references under dispersed in English refer to this Greek word. But if you look under G1290, you're going to find exactly the other verses that use this precise word in the original text without knowing what that says in the left-hand column. Although the transliteration of this particular word happens to be an English word, diaspora, which is what it means. <laughs> so when you click on the 1290, well, you land on this page with a whole lot of complicated things. The concordance page. At the top of this page is our Greek word, diaspora, and a bunch of other stuff. 
that you don't care about. Just skip it. Keep scrolling. Scroll down till you get to the part that says concordance results shown using the translation of your choice. I put ESP in. This is where you get the verses that are using that Greek word. The exact same Greek word that we just picked out of James 1.1, 1, 1, which happens to show in this list for dispersion, is used in John 7.35. Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks? And in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, to those who are the exiles of the dispersion, these are, as it says, the three occurrences in three verses. So this exact word is used three times, and these are they. In and of itself, this doesn't necessarily tell you what the dispersion, what does it mean to be dispersed. That's fine. But it is showing you how that James and 1 Peter have the same audience. That's useful, isn't it? Now you know, well, when we say the dispersion, what are we talking about? Well, you can do something else that's crazy. If you scroll back to the top of the screen for this word diaspora, there's another section at the top that says root word etymology. It says it comes from this thing, and look what that is. It's a link, and look there, there's your G, 1289. That looks like a Strong's number, because it is a Strong's number. Meaning there's another Greek word here that is the father or the parent of the one we're on. Well, let's go see what's behind that door. Oh, sorry. I had it. No, this is correct. This is what's behind that door. Three other verses. The three places where that appears are Acts 1, 8 and verse 1. There arose a great persecution against Jerusalem. They were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now here's an example where if you looked up the word scattered, you would never have found James 1, verse 5. Dispersion. Or I'm sorry, verse whatever it was. Verse 1. You would never have found it. And when you look up dispersion, you would never have found Acts 8, 1. Because it says scattered in English. But this is actually the same word. And Acts 8, 4, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And Acts 8, 11, 9, team. Those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, which was Acts 7, right before Acts 8, 1. Traveling. So you know now that we're talking very precisely about the Christians who were scattered from Jerusalem at the time that the persecution arose over Stephen. That is to whom James wrote, and that is to whom Peter wrote. That's useful information because it tells you what they were thinking, what they were going through at the time. It also tells you that this would have been written prior to Acts 11, or Acts 10. Because in Acts 10, Acts 11, Peter learns that the gospel isn't just for the 12 tribes of the dispersion. It's for the Gentiles, too. That's when he learned about Cornelius, the Roman. That's when in Acts 11, he was able to teach all the others in, in uh, Jerusalem that God has opened the door for the Gentiles. It's not a Jewish thing. That tells you that James was written very early, and 1 Peter was written very early. See, there's lots of useful things you get from this study. Now, if I go back to the top of the page here for the, the parent of my original query, well, he has a root word, too, from, well, two things in Greek. The first one is dia. When you click on it, you, you can tell immediately that it's just a preposition. That's not where the meaning is. The next word there is spero. There's word in, there's meaning in that word. So when I went to look there, what are these verses? Well, one of them is Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap. Matthew 13, 3. A sower without to sow.
right? Sowing, scattering. Now it preaches, right? Because we say they were scattered from Jerusalem, and they were. But another way of looking at that is the seed was sown from Jerusalem. Remember Acts 8, 4? Those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Very interesting, isn't it? The reason why I use this one is so that you can tell you don't need the dictionary for this. You already know exactly what it means and what the implications of that are. You know what it means. You know how to, where it comes from and how those relate to each other very well. It's a very clear thought that the Spirit is presenting to us. And this happens frequently. In fact, it happens most of the time. It is a rare occasion that I will have to go to the dictionary to look up Spero and figure out what does this mean? Where did this come from? Usually, chasing down the word and seeing where it's used somewhere else will give you a very good understanding of the meaning of this thing. So when it comes to is this right, is this wrong, you can use a concordance. You can search. You can search in English online and then drill down to find the original word to make your searching even more sharp. And you can drill down on the root words of those words to get deeper still. It, that's what I do most of the time. Sometimes I will get the, the lexicon out. And those are probably things that nobody else cares about, frankly. <laughs> I'm probably the only person with that question. <laughs> it shouldn't be so complicated. ask somebody who is faithful. Ask a leader. Ask a Christian. You know, put the answer to the test. If it comes from me, if it comes from your mom and dad, if it comes from a, a brother or sister in Christ, whatever, put it to the test. But ask. The Ethiopian unit wasn't ashamed to, to ask, what's the meaning of Isaiah 53? Haven't obeyed the gospel. It's time to obey the gospel. It isn't the case that we achieve some kind of a perfection, completion, maturity before we obey, and then we get in line. No, no. it's when you know that you love God, you care what God thinks. As we started today with a perfectly valid question: How do I know what is right? How do I know whether something is right? That's a great place to be. You're ready to be a child of God. If in, this, in that way of thinking, you're ready to become a Christian. Repent of sins. Repent of things in the past with a vow, if you will, in your own mind before God to serve Him faithfully from now on. And to learn and grow, you know, Read this thing, as we talked about just now. Read it. Look things up when you have questions. Drill down in your study. Um, ask somebody who is faithful. And you learn and you grow. And God blesses you. As we said before, he will be with you. He wants you to be saved. He will help you in difficult situations. You don't need to be concerned that... Uh, you know, I don't know if I can make it. Well, uh, it's good to have a, a sense of the weight of what you're taking on. But understand that none of us can make it on our own. Nobody is strong enough to do this without the help of God. Believing 
in him and obeying him is how you get the blessings and the help and the strength that you need to finish this course. Today, if you're not a Christian, put him on a baptism for forgiveness of sins. We'll help you do that if it's at all possible for us to be of service to you. If, as a Christian, you haven't lived right, let us help you with our prayers on your behalf. All of us need encouragement, too. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let it be known. Am I coming to the front at this time while we stand? Let's send this all to